relax, it's ASMR. Compare the need for control to examples from scripture. In this theological mindset, it's important to see where in the Gospels or in the writings of the Apostles do we see a commensurate drive towards control. Where do we see Christ insisting that a person conform to a certain set of standards before he will interact with them? Where do we see Christ demanding that events and circumstances occur according to his agenda and refusing to participate if they don't? Where in the writings of Paul do we see him encouraging Christians to protest and disengage with Roman society? Where do we see any of the apostles making plans to take over the government of a town or city or influence the political process in any way? These aspirations to power are simply not found in the ministry of Jesus or the apostles. Christ often responded to those who questioned him with a question of his own, and he seemed to be content with leaving some questions cryptically unresolved. His ministry throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria, make sure that's spelled correctly, had a certain vagabond quality, driven by necessity and external forces. In several instances, the press of crowds or open opposition forced him to move from his planned course of action. This theme of power. This theme of power makes up the main theme of his temptation by Satan, who is urging him to take control, to change his circumstances, exercise his power, and claim what they both knew was within his right to claim. He refused these things, I should say. Make it clear who I'm talking about. Christ refused these things because they were not the point of his ministry. They were not even a legitimate way to achieve the goals of his ministry. Similarly, Paul exhorts his readers to live righteous lives within the social order of the Roman Empire. The church he and other apostles established was not a political entity. Its mechanisms for changing the culture did not rely on traditional lovers of power. Paul spoke to the people of wealth and influence, but he himself did not aspire to these things. He led a life driven by the dictates of circumstances. When arrested and imprisoned, he complied fully with the system. Never do we read of him excoriating the legal system or telling his readers that they should rightfully be the ones ruling the Roman Empire. In fact, we read from Paul the statement that, in whatever state I am in, I am content. There is a marked indifference to Christian values being dominant in the ascent of the culture, with the ascent of the cultural majority. And Paul had no interest in establishing a system in which this could come about. Examining this dichotomy between the current American conservative Christian mindset and the exor- exorations, make sure that's the right word I need, the exorations of Scripture requires a look at the foundational assumptions which undergird the Protestant Reformation as progressed by Calvin. Calvin's basic binary methodology dictates that if scripture is to be believed, it must be unquestioned, and if it is to be unquestioned, it needs to dominate the whole of human concerns. In order for this dominance to be maintained, two things must happen. Humanity must be humbled to the point of complete submission, and the church must be made the means by which the dominance of scripture is maintained in society. This defines the primary motivation of Calvin's lifelong efforts. He was a man singularly compelled by his beliefs and his reasoning to transform the church into a war machine, purpose-built to do battle against its enemies and defend the authority of Scripture. Unfortunately, he built his machine facing the wrong battlefield, and the church continues to suffer the consequences. Before engaging in this closer examination, it is important to note that the theological position of the Reformation, such as the belief that faith alone is needed for salvation and that humanity depends upon the specific revelation of God in Christ to understand its need for the substitutionary atonement of his death to restore us to God the Father, are not in question. The problem lies in the methods and extrapolation of Calvin's theology. It is also important to note that this is not an attack on Calvin's character. His efforts to amass and consolidate power to the church were not for selfish reasons. He did little in his position of power to accumulate personal wealth or or prestige. The dichotomy between Calvin's claims and his methodology. The primary method Calvin used to humble his fellow humans was to denigrate the usefulness and trustworthiness of their will and reason. Unlike Luther, 
Calvin acknowledged the existence of free will, but saw, saw it as hopelessly bound to sin. While it maintained a sort of capacity to choose, it could only choose one thing, sin. Men and women could not trust their choosing or reasoning. By this, Calvin renders the human capacity in this area useless. Profane men think that religion rests only on opinion, and therefore that they may not believe foolishly or on slight grounds desire to insist to have it proved by reason that Moses and the prophets were divinely inspired. But I answer that the testimony of the Spirit is superior to reason. But those who, while they profess to be the disciples of Christ, still st- seek for free will in man, notwithstanding of him his being lost and drowned in spiritual destruction, labor under manifold delusions, making a heterogeneous mixture of inspired doctrine and philosophical opinions, and so err as to both. At the same time, it is impossible to think of our primitive dignity without being immediately reminded of the sad spectacle of our ignominy and corruption. Ever since, well, we fell from our origin, original in the person of our first parent. In this way, we feel dissatisfied with ourselves and become truly humble, while we are inflamed with a new desire to seek after God, in whom each may regain those good qualities of which we are found to be utterly destitute. As to the will, its depravity is but to be well known, is but too well known. Therefore, since reason, by which man discerns between good and evil, and by which he understands and judges as a natural gift, it could not be entirely destroyed, but being partially weakened and partially corrupted, and shapeless ruin is all that remains. In this sense, it is said in John 1, 5, that the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. These words clearly express both, expressing both points, vis a that in the perverted and degenerate nature of man, there is still some spark which shows that he is a rational animal and differs from the brutes in so much that he is endued with intelligence, and yet that this light is so smothered by clouds of darkness that it cannot shine forth in any good effect. In like manner, the will, becoming inseparable from the nature of man, did not perish, but was so enslaved by depraved lust as to be incapacitated of one righteous desire. Okay, I may. I need to shorten some of these. I don't need all of these quotes. I think I can take these these out and just stick with these two. But does... But does Calvin really believe all that he says about the utter uselessness and corruption of the human will and reason? We find places in his writing where he encourages his reader to use these facilities to follow his logic and convince themselves of what he is saying. Quote, but you object. That amounts to a disparagement of the Holy Spirit, through whom all good works are done. Not at all. If you distinguish clearly and intelligently between what is of human origin and is in a good work and what is of the Spirit. This is because the whole of the Institutes of the Christian Religion is a treatise on the use of logic and reason to work through a theological problem. Calvin starts with a premise, builds around it an argument, and then defends it. To cite one example, in the Institute of the Christian Religion, Calvin bolsters his argument for predestination by employing the following logic. He first makes a distinction between prescience and predestination. And then I'm going to skip... That quote, just for the sake of time. To prove this distinction, Calvin cites God's treatment of the posterity of Abraham. Using passages from Deuteronomy, Calvin shows that God chose to give portions of the land to the children of Israel and to reject other nations as a pure act of his will and not because of any particular merit of the Israelites. The endowments with which God has adorned them, they all ascribe to gratuitous love not only because they knew that they had not obtained them by any merit, but that not even was the holy patriarch endued with a virtue that could produce such distinguished honor for himself and his posterity. This, Calvin writes, is proof to everyone that God chooses independently of any outside influence, regardless of the opinions of others. 
Calvin then pivots and draws an analogy. It is to be observed that when the land is mentioned, it is a visible symbol of the secret election which adoption is comprehended. This is a second election that Calvin refers to as the hidden election of God, which was confirmed both by the first and second elections and by other intermediate mercies. Calvin deduces this from Isaiah 15.1 that reads, The Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel. This second secret election is a sign of a firm and stable election, notwithstanding of the apparent abandonment. And if the severity of his chastisements has amounted to reprobation, or the captivity had been an interruption of election, which, however, remains involatile, though the signs of it do not always appear. From this second secret election, Calvin argues that sometimes election is a stable, secure state of God's favor, and sometimes it is not. He lays out a process of winnowing by which God throughout history has been cutting individuals and groups out of his special favor. And I will skip that quote as well. By the removal from his favor of those who did not show proper gratitude, God demonstrates that he was under no law but was free so that he was by no means to be restricted to an equal division of grace. It's very inequity, inequity proving to be gratuitous. This forms the first part of Calvin's reasoning regarding election. He goes on to write that God's gratuitous election has not been has only been partially explained until we come to the case of single individuals to whom God not only offers salvation but also assigns it that the certainty of the results remain no, not dubious or suspended. Calvin makes the case that Christians are bought into adoption by this second secret election that when God, after making a covenant of eternal life, invites his people to himself, a special mode of election is in part understood, so that he does not, with promiscuous grace, effectively elect all of them. Another quote. Calvin wraps up this reasoning, and there's another quote. To him, his argument is sound, complete, and needs little defending. And then he basically says how great his reasoning is. And this quote. The effectiveness of this line of arguments may be debated, but it nevertheless clearly demonstrates that Calvin shows no hesitancy in using his reason to prove his case, point by point. And, since he is not claiming to be divinely inspired, he therefore demonstrates the use of his own will to direct his reasoning. But what he allows for himself, he is hesitant to grant to others. Several times in his writing, he discourages the very behavior he so readily indulges in. And then these quotes are basically him telling people not to think too hard about what he just said. And he knows what he's talking about. Don't question him. Calvin's prevarications on this issue stem from the fact that he has no choice but to be of two minds. To Calvin, the taint of corruption in human reasoning is so pervasive that it affects all its applications. But the more he builds his case with one hand, he just as quickly builds a case against himself with the other. Because Calvin deals in absolutes, to him the matter of man and God are black and white, with a clear demarcation between the two. The complete holiness of one must imply the complete depravity of the other. Yet, to prove his point, he has no other tools but the ones that he com so completely despises. He cannot reach across the divide to borrow the blessed instruments of higher gnosis, so he is fated to defeat himself. He is forced to use the very thing that he hates to prove his case, and so, in succeeding, he fails to prove the uselessness of free will and reason. To avoid falling into the binary trap in the opposite direction, that is not spelled correctly, it is important to note that defending the effectiveness of reason and free will is not to find them subsequently free of all weaknesses, nor is it to declare that men and women are free from flaws and masters of their own destiny. We, we may not be doomed and bound in the way or to the degree that Calvin describes, but humanity is nevertheless constrained in ways that further undermine Calvin's dogmatic position of sola scriptura. Three unavoidable realities. There are three fundamental realities that should give us pause when considering Calvin's absolutist claims about his or anyone's interpretation of scripture. These realities have nothing to do with the nature of Scripture or its stature as the inspired Word of God. 
they deal with our abilities as humans to be dogmatic about our interpretation and application of it. The first inescapable reality is that we use language to understand God. Language, to be of any use as a method of communication, must deal in generalities. When one speaks or writes to another about trees or horses or books, the ideas communicated to their mind are not of the specific tree, horse, or book to which the speaker refers, but to the general category of trees, horses, and books. Humans cannot have a word for every single blade of grass, but by the constraints of utility must speak of the concept of grassness with each other. One can use additional descriptors to further refine their meanings, but these two designate terms that have useful but relative definitions. A big red book is only big compared to smaller books and only red to those who can see that color. This is not a flaw of language. In fact, it is the fact that it is built on ideas of things and not on the actual individual instances of those things is its strength. Without this, we could never communicate with each other. Verbal symbols, then, are inherently defective. They are at best a sort of generalized, averaged-out substitute for a complex reality comprising an infinite number of individual particulars. We can say that a pane of glass is square, oblong, round, or half a dozen other shapes, and that when it is shattered, the pieces are fragments or slivers. But for the infinite variety of forms which those slivers in reality assume, we have no words. The multiple reality we generalize as slivers of glass can never be known through words. We can know that reality only through our senses. This is an important concept to grasp, because while humanity has access to the particular instances in our world of trees and horses and books, we do not have access to the full particular instance of God. He is locked away from us, and we are left only with an abstract layer of language to talk about him. So when we speak or write about God, we are using the only tool we have, and while it is powerful and effective, it cannot approach the reality of the high and holy God. Humanity is completely dependent on those particular aspects of his nature he chooses to reveal to us. In this, we count ourselves most fortunate that God has revealed himself to us in a particular instance that we can understand and relate to. While the revelation of God in the incarnate body of Christ does not release us from the abstractness of language, it gives us a point of reference for that language. We can now speak with somewhat more precision when we speak of God, but only as it relates to the life and work of Christ. Communicating anything about God beyond this, which we must and we ought, requires a great deal of caution, lest we convince ourselves of the things that we cannot possibly be sure of. Because having mastered the words, we are satisfied that we have mastered the thing. The second inescapable reality is that we do not have the original inspired text of Scripture to read and analyze. Time, wars, persecution, and forgetfulness have removed them from us, necessitating our reliance on copies. Fortunately, we have multiple copies from multiple sources that we can compare and that help us reconstruct the original text as closely as we can reasonably approximate. Beyond the matters of copies, very few read the original languages in which Scripture was written. We depend on translations for our understanding. These interpretations introduce another human element into the process. Translation is never a straightforward process. I use process twice here. The abstract nature of language means that often a translator has multiple options, which give multiple shades of meaning and different emphasis to the text. A person cannot translate a work without making it substantially their own. Even the most fastidious and faithful translators leave their traces behind. Whatever overtones a translation has, whatever real meaning it conveys, are supplied by the translator. To the extent that he translates freely, these overtones express his own personality. To the extent that he abjures freedom and strives for fidelity, his writing becomes stylistically neutral, or even neuter, which is to say, incapable of generating life. None of these realities should lead us to suppose that Scripture is ineffective. It has been reliably handled as the Holy Scriptures throughout history and represents the best version of the original text that we could reasonably expect to receive. 
But any biblical scholar who has studied the history of the Bible or anyone who has multiple translations knows that there is no such thing as a perfect translation. Even the King James Version, which many deem to be the gold standard, suffers from the effect of time. Its words have become archaic or shifted in meaning to the modern reader. The point of raising these realities to mind is to introduce an element of caution when we are tempted, as Calvin, Fontill, this is two words, Rushduni and others are, to elevate scripture to a place of absolute authority, relying on a supposed purity that is unrealistic. This is especially true when using scripture to render punitive or even deadly verdicts on others. This leads us to the third inescapable truth. Given the layers of abstraction forced upon us, any individual or organization that claims the ability to establish the direct rule of God on earth, a theocracy, are unsubstantiated and false. To make of Scripture an ultimate authority by which all other matters of human endeavor are judged and regulated is to place on it a weight it was not designed to bear. So while the principles and truths of Scripture should be used to guide our actions and inform our decision-making, it cannot be used as the sole source of laws. Neither should the passages it contains pertaining to the works of the natural world be allowed to override the outcomes of scientific discovery. Because the reality is, a theocracy is just the rule of man or woman, with yet another layer of abstraction, that it shields the actor from proper degree of responsibility to which they should be held. A Refutation of Calvin's Claims Calvin's motivation to establish the sole rule of Scripture over all human life, replacing the role of will and reason, are based on a worldview that does not align with the reality of humans' ability to know and understand those Scriptures. While we are not weak to the degree which Calvin describes, we are nonetheless weak. Our inability to speak about God in a precise manner, and our inability to interpret Scripture with absolute certainty, provides a tenuous foundation on which to build a system of rule that can completely replace the role of free will and reason. Additionally, we cannot guard against the twisting of that system into a mechanism of greed, power, and oppression. In the end, Humans cannot establish that we are completely correct in our understanding of the relationship between God and man. Our dogmatic stance on particular issues of theology are all a bluff. No one has the higher ground or the privilege to establish certainty to the degree that constitutes binding law based solely from the pages of Scripture. The strength of Christianity does not, and by the necessity of our human limitations cannot, lie in the establishment that we are right beyond all doubt. The very invocation of the concept of faith precludes that possibility. When Calvin set the church to fight on this battlefield, he committed it to expending tremendous amounts of energy that are, in the end, a waste of its vitality and a perversion of its purpose. This is not to denigrate the role, importance, or importance of theology. Quite the opposite. Humans should use their capacity for reason to better understand God and man. There is much to be gained by the reading of thoughts of others about these topics. The truth is not unknowable, but our approach to the truth should be one of humility, and our application of that truth should be done with analysis and caution. A church obsessed with proving itself and others that it is right beyond doubt is an inward-facing, reactive church that defends itself behind walls of dogma, splintering into ever smaller groups. This leads to a church cut off from society and reality, unable to withstand criticism, and simply waiting to be rescued in an apocalyptic vision of, see, I told you we were right. 